Many years ago, many, many, many years ago, when I started learning the scripture, I was amazed at God's tremendous capabilities, as, of course, you would expect from the creator of the universe. And I was kind of thinking this kind of cultural relevance. In the Jewish community, there's a high value placed when a young man meets a young woman and then eventually meets her family. The young man is normally asked when he walks in and introduces himself, so what do you do for a living? The implied answer is, how are you going to take care of my daughter? Right? And of course, in that community, normally the kids, as you probably have well become aware of, Jewish kids or the families value education and professional, a professional life and all of that. And so the question, what do you do for a living, or possibly even, what does your father do for a living? Now, I, I, I was uh, privy to a uh, comedy routine many years ago by Don Rickles. I'm not going to get into that whole thing. But the implication in that little conversation he had with somebody in the audience was very deep. Because families, and it happened in my family as well, one of my cousins married a young woman, and he was pulled into the family business. And so that's just kind of how things go. In the next few minutes, we're going to examine a few things that God does for a living. What does God do for a living? I've been thinking about this sermon for probably 20 to 30 years. And finally, Doug said to me, you got to start teaching sometime. I said, I got an idea for a sermon. And he said, give it a shot. So here we are today. So you guys are my guinea pigs, right? Or guinea lambs, as the case may be. I got to remember where I am. God is a farmer and a planter. Do you know that? In Genesis chapter 2, he planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man who he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for a food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I think this is pretty obvious, right? And by the way, I have no idea what lushness was there, but I know that Ezekiel addresses that later. God is a matchmaker. Do you know that? Yeah. God is a matchmaker. In Genesis 2:18, 22, and 24, the Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make him a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on the man and he slept and then took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. I guess I could add here that God is a surgeon, right? The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and he brought her to the man. In verse 24, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Some other examples of God's matchmaking capabilities. Of course, we know that at Mount Sinai, the children of Israel were, symbolically anyway, married to the Lord. Later on, Yeshua will take for himself a bride. And by the way, we're all part of that. There will be a future wedding that we'll all be attending in royal garb. Later on, the Lord sets up Ruth and Boaz. And we know how that models the Messiah and the congregation. And so it goes. How about this one? God is a naval architect and a ship designer. Did you know that? Yeah, pretty cool. This, of course, is a replica of the Ark as built in Kentucky at the Ark Encounter. I was going to show you a video, but I ran out. There's no way we have enough time for this, but it's an amazing thing that they've done. Of course, it cost them, this gentleman, Ken Ham, uh, something like $100 million with, of course, other funds uh, that he raised. And though this man has attracted both supporters and detractors, the design and the construction of the ark is right on the specs that the book of Genesis talks about. Let's take a look at God's 
career as a naval ship designer. There is the ark at about 51 feet high, and there's the picture at sunset. I love that picture right there because it just kind of gives you another perspective on it. Let's take a look at some of the words. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood or coffer wood, and you shall make the ark with rooms and shall cover it inside and outside with pitch. This is how you shall make it. The length of the ark will be 300 cubits, its breadth 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. And you shall make a window for the ark and finish it to a cubit from the top and set the door of the ark uh, in the side, and you shall make uh, of it lower, second, and third decks. So I've got a couple of notes here I pull from the Creation Science Institute. Note that the ratio of length to width of the ark's design, 300 cubits to 50 to, four, uh, to um, let's see, 30, is about 450 feet long and about 75 feet wide. The ratio of 6 to 1 is well known in naval design for optimum stability. Many modern naval engineers, when designing cargo ships and battleships alike, utilize this same basic design. Go figure. The ark's long, slender shape would have been maximized for cargo space, and it would have kept the vessel pointed into the wave trends, thereby minimizing chances of it being broadsided by a wave that could capsize it. As a matter of fact, the ark is really a big floating barge because it wasn't really powered. It just kind of went along with the flow. You may have seen this little meme on the internet when you're stressed out. Remember this. The Titanic was built by professionals. And the ark was built by amateurs. We would see a pair of forces consisting of the ark's weight acting downward and the buoyancy, I, can, I don't know any of this stuff engineering-wise, I'm just kind of going along with the flow here, acting upward what form the naval engineers would call a riding couple. That's R-I-G-H-T-I-N-G. -I -I would ride itself in the water. The pair of forces acting in opposite but parallel direction tends to force the vessel to, the, to ride itself when tilted. And as we showed in the figure up here, any degree of tilt for 90 degrees, the couple would right the arc and return it to its upright position. Of course, that was all designed. Several engineering studies of arc models have compared the design as given in scripture to several other potential design ratios and plans. A, an elaborate and extensive comparison was carried out by the Korea Institute of Ship and Ocean Engineering. As in each of the studies, the arc's design was shown to be the optimum for its task and circumstances. So I want you to guys know, you guys know Debbie Brown here, right? Debbie leads a, an occasional tour to Israel. I think we ought to attach a trip to Kentucky along with that next time we go. What do you think of that? God is a rancher. Did you know that? He's a rancher. A herdsman and a shepherd. In Psalm 50, verse 10, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Cattle being, of course, a sign of wealth, a measurable sign of wealth back then. And, of course, I just wanted to select three pictures of these wonderful beasts, everyone unique in its design and its purpose. The bear, I think that's a wildebeest in the middle, and, of course, the cattle on a thousand hills. God is an architect and an interior designer. The Mishkan, the tabernacle in the wilderness, from Exodus, 15 chapters on the tabernacle, and the priests, and the clothing, and the furniture, two chapters on the creation. What does that tell you about the ratio? Important stuff to know. Let them construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell with them, tabernacle with them. According to all that I am going to show you as the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all of its furniture, just so you shall construct it. It's been mentioned that when Moses came down from the mountain, he came down with the tablets. It has also been recommended that he possibly came down with a set of engineering uh, designs or architectural designs along with it. Don't know that for sure. If that was all burned into Moses' mind, at least they, they got it out. This is a result of it. In verse 40, see that you make them after the pattern for them which was shown to you on the mountain. 
Now, the word um, uh, copy is the word tabnit in Hebrew. It means a copy or a form, an image, a likeness, or a model, a pattern, or a plan. You kind of get the, the general sense of this. And why was this so important? Because in Hebrews chapter 8, it tells us that this is a model of heaven. And that is just, to me, a stunning portrayal of what is to come. The deep study of the tabernacle, as I mentioned in Exodus 25 through 40, gives us a rich detail, detail by detail, each piece symbolic and typical of Yeshua's ministry. No, t- no detail is left out. Nothing is out of place. Each is superbly laid out to cause him the glory. God is a stone cutter and an engraver. Some of these images on the internet were kind of fun. I was pouring through them and I thought, that was kind of neat. It's, bla- it's got blazes and rocks and granite and who knows what else. Verse 18 in Exodus 31, when he had finished speaking with him on, uh, on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone, some of the most dramatic scriptural reading written by the finger of God. And in verse 32, 15, Moses turned and went down from the mountain with his two tablets of the testimony in his hand and tablets which were written on both sides. They were written on one side and the other. And in verse 16, the tablets were God's work and the writing was God's writing engraved on the tablets. Now there, are two, there were two sets of tablets here. You might remember the first set Moses broke after he came down from the mountain and watched the children of Israel at sin. Um, if we add Exodus 34, 1, the Lord said to Moses, cut out for yourself two stone tablets like the former ones, and I will write on the tablets the words which were on the former tablets which you shattered. So in the first set of tablets, God cut, he hewed the stone himself and then wrote the words on it. In the second one, then Moses had to cut the stone after the sin was committed by the children of Israel. And so be ready, Moses is told by God in the morning, come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on top of the mountain. And in verse 4, so he cut the two stone tablets out like the former ones, and Moses rose up early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him and took two stone tablets in his hand. The Lord descended in the cloud, stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. I cannot imagine what Moses must have been feeling, but we know as we move on later on, Moses says, or God is t- tells Moses, write down the words in accordance with all these words, which I have made a covenant with you in Israel. And later on in that chapter, he was there with the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights and took no food or water. I keep thinking to myself, that must have been a, quite an incredible time for Moses, surrounded by God's glory. Quite a Bible study. It must have been something else to see. And Moses then writes on the tablets the words of the covenant, or God did. In verse 29, later on, it comes about that Moses was coming down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of testimony that were in his hand. And he was coming down from the mountain. Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because of his speaking with him. There's slightly discrepant, something discrepant here. And I looked around and found that Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 1 through 5, adds this detail that was missing from the Exodus account. Moses had an ark of wood up there as well. So Deuteronomy 10 kind of completes the story that is not plainly evident here in Exodus 31 and 32. God is an author of light and darkness and even disaster. In Rod's talk there, he mentions the words ra'ah or the word ra'ah in Hebrew. found this little cartoon when I typed in Job 38, the whirlwind that Job and his friends were found themselves in. In verse 7, the one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity, where the word ra in Hebrew, or ra, I am the Lord who does all these. God is the author of calamity and evil, all for his purpose. We think of our little lives here and how comfortable things might be. We don't want harm to come to us, but there may be a lot ahead. We don't know. Don't get too comfortable. Rod's lecture was, I think, pretty clear there. There's going to be conflict along the way. And sometimes the situations that we find ourselves in, 
that we are praying to be taken out of, the Lord has put us in those situations for our learning and our benefit. And there isn't one of you in this room that can tell me that you haven't experienced that. That trouble comes to us for a reason. And sometimes we're there not only to learn the lesson for ourselves, but to be there for someone else who may need our help. Your presence in somebody's life is critical. And you never know when you're going to be called upon to be a blessing for somebody else in the middle of the trouble. Make sense to you? Isaiah 45 brings new and stunning details of God's power over creation, and as I mentioned, even disaster. And when you read Job 38, after all the stuff that Job went through, God then explains his plan to Job and his friends. Verse 18, for thus says the Lord who created the heavens, he is the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it and did not create it as a waste place, but formed it to be inhabited. And here's the words that should be echoing in our minds every day. I am the Lord. There is none else. God is a military commander. Adonai Tzvaot, the Lord of hosts. We just learned from Doug a couple of weeks ago in Joshua 5. Now it came about when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing opposite him with a sword drawn in his hand, and Joshua went to him and said, are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, no, rather, I indeed come now as a captain of the Lord of hosts, the host of the Lord. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and bowed down and said to him, what has my Lord to say to his servant? We know that this is an appearance of the angel of the Lord, and this is the, the creator of the universe, the very the one that makes it all happen. But he takes the form here of a military commander. And in verse 15, the captain of the Lord's host says to Joshua, remove your sandals from your feet for the place where you are standing is holy. And by goodness, Joshua did so. This is the exact same experience that Moses had at Mount Sinai, which underscores and validates who the individual is. This is the Lord God taking physical presence. And when you have people that say, well, man can't become God, you say you're right. But God became man. And when Yeshua said, I've been with you from the beginning, I wonder if he was referring to these incidents, these different times where he appeared to Israel in different forms. Okay. So this is what this is what really drove the message home to me. God can do anything. He's the creator of the universe. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He can do, he can say, he can, he's everywhere. But at his heart, he's a teacher. And he never stops. Let's take a look. For any, are there any teachers here? Anybody here teach? No, Nancy does. Several teachers here. So you know learning theory. We learn, really, in a way, through the five senses. We're going to talk about three of them today. We learn visually. We learn auditorily through the ears. And we learn by doing, touching. For any of you that have done well learning how to cook, you know that you can't read a cookbook and say, okay, now I know how to make a prime rib. You got to do it, right? For those that practice law, it's nice to read the law so you can understand it, but it's something entirely different to stand up in front of a courtroom and teach the law. Because inevitably, you're teaching the law, aren't you? Whatever that means. You can be a soccer fan, but if you've never kicked the soccer ball, it means nothing. Teachers know this, and teachers use every opportunity to create the learning experience for their teachers. Let's take a look. This is how humans learn. Auditory, visual, and kinesthetic learning, which is by doing. So Nancy 
Sands, just let me know if I'm off track here, right? Nancy taught for many years, and I'm depending on her to keep me on straight. 1 John 1.1, 1, 1. what was from the beginning we have heard, we have seen with our eyes what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. When that popped up on the screen, I thought to myself, this kind of summarizes everything we know. It's all there. We learn by seeing. Let's take a look. In John 20, 29, Yeshua said to him, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. Every one of us fits that model. We are blessed because we believe without having actually seen him face to face, although we will one day. From Exodus 14, 13, but Moses said to the people, do not fear, stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. The Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. Get the message there? Seeing. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. The use of the eyes can be, although a little bit, sometimes a little bit challenging. And so we're going to look at another way of learning, learning by hearing. The auditory learning process involves obviously two ears. My mom used to say to me, you've got two ears, one mouth, use them in proportion. A wise son hears his father's instruction, but a scorner hears not rebuke. Proverbs 13. In Deuteronomy 6, 4, remember God's great commandment. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord, our one, the Lord is one. By the way, the word hear there, Shema, is a command. It's not a suggestion. Hey, you might want to listen to this. No. It is hear, listen, pay attention. In uh, Romans 10, 17, this is one of the very first scriptures that I learned early on as a believer. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Messiah. It is said that the last thing that goes before a person passes away is their hearing. And I'm depending on that one because as my mom sat in a coma, she was visited by angels, both physical ones and spiritual ones. Don't give up because they can still hear. We learn by touching and by doing. Then he said to Thomas, reach here with your finger and see my hands and reach here with your hand and put it into my side. And don't be unbelieving, but believing. When Yeshua came down from the mountain, it's in Matthew 8, chapter, uh, chapter 8, verse 1. When Yeshua came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. And the leper came to him and bowed down before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And you know that the lepers were separated from the rest of the congregation for the health of the congregation. In verse 2, in verse 3, Yeshua stretches out his hands and touches him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. This is one of the three special miracles that would be Messiah's credentials. Healing a leper. And this was critical because the authorities were watching to see what he did. When he dropped this one on him, it really got things stirred up. In verse 4, Yeshua said to him, see that you tell no one, but go show yourself to the priest and present the offering that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Part of the teacher's role may be to demonstrate that thing to be learned and then use that opportunity to teach. When he heals the leper, Yeshua directs the man to the priest. 
itself as a testimony. You'll notice here this was not done in private. This was done with large crowds watching. He was demonstrating something and making it clear to these people that he meant business. And that's critical for us to understand because as our teacher, he is taking the opportunity to teach while he heals. I think that's an amazing thing. The message, the teaching may have been for the religious authorities, the priests, whoever it was, the multitudes were watching. Just like people are watching you every day. My daughter's 19. She's a singer. She's working with a couple of youth groups. She's out there. It's a great thing to watch her growth. And we've been telling her since she was a little girl when she would act up. And if any of you know my daughter, you know that she is really good at that. Talking, listening to Rod and his siblings, I was thinking, yeah, this is sounding really familiar. But there's something interesting going on because we've been telling her from the start, people are watching you 24-7. And as a believer, good, bad, or indifferent, you're on the clock 24-7. People are watching us in order to find holes in our testimony. So they will be able to come up and say, ha, see, you're like everybody else. But as I'm reminded by my daughter's music teacher when once confronted, you Christians just use Jesus as a crutch. You're all the same. And she says, you're right. Every one of us is a sinner, and we need salvation from that one, that great teacher of ours. So I'm not afraid to admit that. I hope you're not either, because they're going to come after you. Yeshua gave us the model. He demonstrated the technique right in front of us learning by touching and by doing. Trained them, and then he showed them. This is how teachers teach. One-on-one. -on -one. The private one-on-one -on -one session is powerful. And chances are, when you have shared the gospel with somebody, you've done it one-on-one. -on -one. The second one is two-on-one, -on -one, small groups. And we'll talk about that in a second. I have examples of each one of these. How about the leadership team, I call it? The disciples, 12 on one, it could be 8 on one, 22 on one, whatever it is. Sometimes you grab a group of people and you teach. And then, of course, the multitudes in a lecture format. Let's take a look at some of these examples. The one-on-one, -on -one, probably the one that, is, that stands out the most to me was Yeshua and Nicodemus in John chapter 3. I, I found this clip art. I was looking at that. I was like, you know... I didn't know what to, how this would look, but this summed it up perfectly. The one portrayed there as Nicodemus is just sitting there listening to this much younger man, and he's speaking with authority, and he is telling Nicodemus things that Nicodemus possibly would have never thought of. Let's look at some of the examples here. In verse 1, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, this man came to Yeshua by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you've come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Yeshua answered and said to him, Truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The comments and then the response don't seem to match at all. Nicodemus is telling him one thing, hey, you're different. You do great things. Yeshua comes right back and says, you must be born again. One-on-one -on -one teaching provides the teacher a private discussion without fear. There's no fear of outside noise, so to speak. The learner can be open and unafraid of the results of that private session, while the teacher has no distractions for the learner. The discussion obviously bears fruit, as we will later see, because Nicodemus, joining himself with Joseph of Arimathea, are the ones that are assigned to take Yeshua's body off the cross, provide for the burial. Nicodemus and Joseph later take tremendous risks because of their position in the social structure. Nicodemus had come at night to visit Yeshua and get his questions answered, indicating 
that he was clearly afraid of a confrontation in the marketplace, of being found out by his fellow Pharisees. What makes the exchange interesting to me is that Yeshua asks him, aren't you a teacher of Israel? Aren't you, don't you know these things? He expected Nicodemus to know the concepts of being born again. And yet, I don't ever remember seeing that clearly spelled out in the Tanakh, and yet the teachers were expected to know this. Yeshua cannot be surprised, of course. We know that he cannot really learn because he's 100% man and 100% God. We can glean from Nicodemus' reaction that to whom much is given, much is accepted, expected. He was a highly educated man and a great teacher in the nation, and yet his knowledge was limited. And then Yeshua uses this opportunity to call him out and put the expectation right in front of him. We don't know how long this confrontation lasted. If, you, if Nicodemus was there for a few minutes or a few hours, we don't really know. But the recorded words here are the full exchange. We don't know a lot about this. We do know one thing. The value of the one-on-one -on -one encounter is incalculable. Another example of this one-on-one -on -one exchange could be found in John 4, when Yeshua confronts the woman at the well. And the questions and the answers that come conclude with her recognizing him as Messiah, another example of the one-on-one -on -one power, the power of the one-on-one -on -one opportunity. So then that leaves us. Where do, we, where do we fit in all of this? Tools that we have, millions of Bible tools online. Our Bibles, of course, have lots of helps in them, everything from maps to commentaries to who knows what. We also have Gabe's apologetic series, which has been really powerful. And of course, you have a well-steeped and very learned congregation here. Ask one another. Share what your thinking is and help one another learn. Um, other one-on-one -on -one examples can be found as well in the Old Testament. The exchange with Moses and God face-to-face -face when God prepares him to go preach to the children of Israel. So this one-on-one -on -one model is well known and is well used. But more than anything else, Yeshua makes Nicodemus think. And if you have the ability to provoke somebody to think, you have done your job. We're here to pose the questions and to know how to make people think and to help them learn, to get across the bridge to their internal salvation. Let's take a look at the one-on-two encounter. I used uh, Exodus chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. Then the anger of the Lord burned against Moses, and he said, Is there not your brother Aaron the Levite? I know that he speaks fluently, and moreover, behold, he is coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, he's going to be glad. Verse 15, you're to speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I, even I, will be with your mouth and his mouth, and I will teach you what you are about to do. God is a teacher at heart. He never gives up on his students. Don't give up on him. The instructional method from this fuller story in verse 16 includes all three learning modalities. Let's take a look at verse 16 here. Moreover, he shall speak for you to, or for you to the people, and he will be as a mouth for you, and you will be as God to him. And in verse 17, you shall take in your hand this staff, which you shall perform the signs. And I keep thinking of the staff that Paul has got to. You can hold that up for a second. This is the staff. It has a wallop to it. And we learned what happened when Moses held that staff up. Something very interesting happens in Pharaoh's court a little later on. We know that the Lord uses the staff there to perform a miracle. A small group with Mary and Martha. This is just a little extra one. In verse 38 of Luke 10, now as they were traveling along, he entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Miriam, who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to every word. Listening 
to every word. I don't think they had PowerPoint then, but we're going to use it for another tool. In verse 40, Martha was distracted with all of her preparations. And she came up and said to him, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone and tell her to help me? If you've ever prepared a big meal and you're scurrying around the kitchen and trying to clean the house and whatever else you've got to clean, and there's people sitting there doing nothing, drives me nuts, makes me crazy. But the Lord had a different perspective. He answered, he says, Martha, Martha, Martha. You could just hear his voice. You're so worried and bothered about so many things. But only one thing is necessary. For Miriam has chosen the good part which shall not be taken away from her. We're busy scurrying back and forth to jobs and family and friends and holiday get-togethers and whatever else. You've all chosen to come here this morning. I'm blessed by that. But yeah, I'll tell you what I'm even blessed more about. The Lord has left his witness behind. He has given us his word. Spend a few minutes every day with him. Sit at his feet. Listen to his words. Read to one another. Share with one another. Get rid of all the busyness and stop once in a while. Stop and listen. How about the leadership briefing to the larger community of leaders? Yeshua summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Not only did he give them the authority, but what else did he give them? He gave them the how-to. He showed them how to do it. He trained them. Verse 5, Yeshua sent out, after instructing them, sent them out, do not go in the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter any city of the Samaritans. So the message here was still to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And in verse 6, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And in verse 8, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, freely you received, and freely give. I'm going to add to that. Love one another. Visit the sick in the hospital. Make a meal and take it to somebody. There's little things that we can do that will make a difference in other people's lives. By golly, if we're not about that, what are we about? Right? The remainder of this particular chapter illustrates Yeshua's direction to the 12. He is conducting a leadership briefing to the entire leadership team. You can tell I come from a business background, can't you? In addition, application of this use in Luke 9 and 10, he commissions both the 12 and later the 70 as they go preach the kingdom of God. Let's look at the multitudes. This is Yeshua's first teaching experience. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. And in verse 46 in Luke 2, then after three days they found him in the temple, sitting where? Right where he belonged, in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And this, of course, poses one of the most important concepts in Jewish thinking. There were two men, friends, and one looked at the other and he says, why does a Jew always answer a question with a question? And his friend looked at him and said, why shouldn't a Jew answer a question with a question? <laughs> In verse 47, and all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When they saw him, they were astonished, and his mother said to him, Why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. And what does he tell them? 
said to them, Why is it that you were looking for me? Do you not know that I had to be in my father's house about his business? This perception of who belongs to who and who's got station in life or whatever it might be. Behold, as Rod told us earlier, my father and my mother and my brothers and all that. That's who we are together. This is our mishpucha, our family. And I don't care where you come from or what you look like. I don't care if you're Jewish or Gentile. We have a stake in Yeshua's kingship. We have a stake in the kingdom of heaven together. So when you look around and you see your brothers and your sisters, recognize that we are all in this boat together, kind of like the ark. We're in the ark together. There's another example of Yeshua and the multitudes. I don't have time to go through it today, but remember the, we have, of course, the Sermon on the Mount and, of course, the feeding of the 4,000 and later on the 5,000. He is a an outstanding public speaker, another one of his wonderful occupations, and he can hold people's attention like nobody's business. Let's look at some of the tools that teachers use to get through to us. Teachers use parables. For example, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, after David sins with Bathsheba, or Bathsheba, Nathan the prophet comes and the end of that conversation convicts David of his sin and says, you are the man. There's a story about the man that had a sheep. You know how that whole parable was used to illustrate a story. Good teachers use parables, and Yeshua used them liberally, sometimes to clarify a point and sometimes to hide a point. He was the master at using parables. How about reinterpretation of Scripture? Yeshua constantly says things like, you have heard it said, but I tell you. He was the rabbi of rabbis, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and he was the one that set the religious authorities straight. A simile. A simile is a literary device that makes a comparison between two things using the word like or as. Similes make it easier for readers to envision the ideas of an author. How about Matthew 28? And his appearance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. Did you know there are more than 200 literary devices that are used in the Scripture? 200 of them. This is just a list of four or five. How about typologies? In the book, Leanings in Genesis by um, Arthur Pink, there are more than 100 ways that Joseph is a type of the Messiah. And one of the ways, he was never recognized the first time for who he was. Just like Moses and later on like Yeshua, Jewish leaders seem to pass, seem to pass for the first time unrecognized in the community, but the second time they will be recognized. Yeshua was not accepted the first time by the religious authorities. He will be recognized by all of Israel and Zechariah and other places as well. How about models? Moses gives us the building instructions in Exodus chapter 25. The tabernacle or the mishkan acts as a model of heaven, and we know that is validated by the New Testament midrash, chapter 8, verse 5. It is a model of heaven. Now, the next list here illustrates something else about the teaching within a Jewish community and how important these things are. We go through an annual cycle every year based on the 23rd chapter of Leviticus. And we're going to talk about this cycle as we go through. This is called the gift and wisdom of repetition. I am confessing that I am a slow learner. It takes me forever to learn a concept. Ask my daughter about my iPhone. She'll tell you all you need to know. Dad, you should know this by now. True. Once I get it, I get it. Has anybody ever experienced that before? Sure. Every year we go through this cycle 
Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, feast of weeks, trumpets, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Hanukkah, and Purim, which are not technically on the Leviticus, 20, Leviticus 23 list. Now, behold the Christmas tree. Hanukkah bush, thank you. The biblical faith that we follow is a participative faith. Think about how amazing that is, that the learning is built into the holiday. And there are studies out there that will tell you that these repetitions are done for a reason. For those that play music, you know that it takes a long time to learn to play an instrument. <laughs> For those that cook, to become a really good cook takes time, takes practice. It takes failure, right? To learn to grow things. Some people have a gift and a knack to be able to grow things. My father-in-law could do great things in the garden. Me, pretty much everything I try to grow dies. Okay? But it is an amazing thing that through the repetition is where the learning is. And guess what? Each of these festivals, at least certainly the first seven, are going to be repeated in heaven. We are being exposed to an annual rehearsal for the way the millennium and the way heaven is going to look. Right? It's an old joke. Deborah's teaching Hebrew. You can learn it now or learn it in heaven. Maybe you want to get started now. There's a plug for your class, right? But look at what we have to do every year. This is not putting somebody under the law as much as it is the joy of participation with God. We slay the Passover lamb. Maybe we're not doing that now, but we certainly did in the Scripture. And we, but we do conduct a Seder every single year. We go to a Seder. It's a learning opportunity. We eat matzah in the Feast of Unleavened Bread every year for eight days. No bread. By the way, peanut butter is great on matzah. That'll get you through. So is Nutella. The first fruits, we bring the sheaf of first fruits to the priest. On Shavuot, we count the Omer for 50 days, and a new offering is brought to the Lord. In the Feast of Trumpets, or the blowing of the shofar, we observe Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, which is, of course, the civil calendar. We light the Hanukkah at Hanukkah. We live in booths, of course, for Sukkot when we erect our, our, our sukkah. And, of course, the Purim, we provide gifts to the poor every year. Over and over again, we are learning. This is the, we're learning the craft of our faith. And that's why this repetition happens every year. Any good teacher will tell you that drilling is where the kids learn. Drilling through over and over and over again until you got it down. Yeshua did that with the disciples as he trained them to go out into the communities around them and preach the gospel. They were trained and they were ready. Let's look at some requirements now for our learning. Exodus chapter 12. When, you say, when your children say to you, what does this right mean to you, the Passover obviously, you shall say to them, it is a Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians but spared our homes. And in Deuteronomy, these words which I am commanding you today shall be where? On your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, to your sons and your daughters, and you shall talk of them when you sit at your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. There's no time limit here. If your kids are 7 or 47, you're still teaching them. Hopefully, they're still listening. Timothy's gift and Paul's exhortation in 1 Timothy 4, prescribe and teach these things. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example to those who believe. And in verse 13, until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the, pres by the presbytery. Now, we can't complete a study of God's teaching and our teaching 
without visiting James. There's a danger sign here, and be careful. Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, because knowing that, as such, we will be incurring a stricter judgment. I solemnly charge you, 2 Timothy 4, in the presence of God and the Messiah Yeshua, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Prepare, be ready to reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. And they will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. Well, there's a warning for you. How about this one from Second Peter? Chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who, brought, who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. And in verse 2, many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words, their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Be aware of the false teachers. If anybody knows who Vernon Law from the Pittsburgh Pirates was, he was a pitcher in the 1950s and 60s. We have a friend of ours in the congregation here who's from Pittsburgh. And she is going to give me an earful in a few minutes. Go Pittsburgh. Let's summarize. God can and does anything for a living. And though he is capable of anything at his heart, he's a teacher. He uses all learning tools available to him in order to reach his children. He uses different methods, hearing, seeing, and doing. And by the way, taste and smell fall into this somehow. If you look at the first six verse or chapters of, of the book of Leviticus, and you were one that brought a sacrifice to the altar, you smelled it as that barbecue was going up, and you tasted it if you participated in the sacrifice. All five learning modalities working there. God doesn't miss a beat. He teaches us in many ways one-on-one, one-on-two, one-on-twelve, or to the multitudes. But at his heart, he is a teacher. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so very, very much. We are your students, your Talmudim. As we close today, Lord, I am humbled, Lord, by the, the detail and the care to which you take care of us to teach us your word every day. Cause our hearts, Lord, to be circumcised, our ears to listen, our hands to do, and our eyes to see you in all things. And we are forever, Lord, in your debt. And as we close today, Lord, I thank you, Father, for the worship team. We thank you, Lord, as we close the service today with the blessing of the bread in a couple of minutes, we just thank you for this Shabbat in Yeshua's name. Amen. You guys ready?